Welcome back to the Weekly Trend Podcast. Today is Friday, September 27th, 2024. Welcome to the S&P Weekly Trend, currently a sitting podcast at for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. Arling. I'm here with Hurricane Water the Weekly Trend Podcast Ian is provided McMillan. for educational purposes Ian only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners yeah, we are should not act upon the information or content without I'm first sure. seeking advice Friends from a registered financial planner. In Florida or Georgia, South Carolina got a pretty bad. Well, I'm glad you guys are okay, and I'm I'm hoping the people in the areas you just mentioned are doing okay as well. So, last week, we talked about not seeing higher highs in a bear market. Still the same situation this week. Yeah, more all-time highs for S&P and Dow. Russell just still hanging out. I mean, pretty flat for the week, I guess. The last couple of days, but... Well, I did, I did have someone reach out to me that, that listens to the podcast and is a fellow asset manager. He did appreciate that since his son or daughter has been born, IWM hasn't been in new highs. Yeah, that's, that's how, true. that, that's how long it's been, but holding up well, I mean, it's above 210 when you look at IWM and that's an important level. And if we could continue to hold that and chew through supply, which we now know existed from February of 21 through January of 22, that that price formation was all distribution. At the same time, the other thesis is the range that took place from that January of 22 through let's call it early 24 was accumulation. And so now we wait, we have to see, you know, we have a rising 200 day on small caps. We still have not rising. And time will tell. I mean, these these other er- areas broke their broke through their much sooner, like S P five hundred, the Dow Jones. We now have EQAL, which is the Russell one thousand equally weighted. So the t- top one thousand stocks continuing to hold its breakouts, but yet the narratives continue. I know that you like to talk about bricks in the wall of worry. Certainly There's- a lot. I mean, I always plenty in an election year, and really, I think. What's kind of surprising, there have been a lot of bricks in the wall. And, you know, a lot of this supposed to be lining up with election year seasonality. I know September is usually a pretty weak month in general. I think I saw, you know, more specifically the second half of September. And we have bucked that trend. And that's... I think that's an appropriate way to look at seasonality is it's a tendency and it's not about when stock prices match the seasonality. It's about when they don't. And if the second half of September is supposed to be weak, now we still have one trading day after today, but we haven't seen that second half of September weakness. And that's something worth paying, paying attention to. That's information to look at and say, Hey, that's a little bit out of the norm or out of the tendency. So is this market stronger than we think? Despite election narratives, revisions to government data on the economy, the assumption of some type of landing, yield curves, interest rates, interest rates. Yeah, I mean, I guess that falls there. The, uh, and, and I know one that, that you highlighted is just, remember the end carry trade scare. Yeah, that's from early August. We had... We had the rate cut and then rates just started going up again. Can you believe that? Well, the, 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 the latest I heard, Ian, is that Chinese stocks going up is bad. They had that a seems, really good week. Yeah, that seems a little bit odd to say if Chinese stocks are going up, that's bad. When we've had one of the best periods since late October of 23 through now that we've seen in the market and Chinese stocks were going down. Yeah, China at its highest level since really 18 months, probably. And it reeks this week's move. Now, it's still on a downtrend, but this week's move out of Chinese stocks reeks of short closing. Like yeah, all short, all I can short. see that. That's a good That's a good thesis. And all short sellers are future buyers. And so if they're closing out those shorts, when you think about demand and supply, economic law, or demand that supply price goes up or supply demand goes down, the end of a bull market typically happens when you run out of buyers. And 
the bear market in ch Chinese equities, regardless of your opinion on China, if you run out of sellers, the same applies. And yeah, they are. Chinese stocks really struggled. They had a good start to the year like everything else. Good Q1. Really, really struggled. You know, the entire summer, May, August. Big move here. And that just gets you back. Well, you know, I said earlier to the highest level in 18 months, it's still the same spot since 2006. I'm looking at FXI. Okay. So, you know, that's priced in dollars. If you wanted to look at something not priced in dollars, I guess you could use the SSE composite. Also, same spot since 06, early 07. So same spot since 2015. Definitely, definitely a lost decade for your average Chinese stock. And definitely not risk off. If A, we're seeing Chinese stocks stop going down and B, if they start to build a range or move higher, that's risk on behavior. Dr. Like, you... Nick is the first, is the first step in here. That's anonymous meaning. Same thing with buyers anonymous. When prices stop going up, that's the first sign that the bull could be over and these things take time, but higher highs and higher lows continue to confirm a bull market. We continue to have the backdrop of rising 200 day moving averages, the backdrop of a breath thrust in October, early November of last year, echo, I'll call them echo thrusts or breath thrusts in July of this year. And we don't have what I would call an extension of breath. Meaning when you look at like bullish percent on the New York Stock Exchange or bullish percent of the S&P, you don't sit there and say, oh, we're at extreme, you know, we're at, we're at 80 or 90 on the bullish percent. And therefore that's where you start to run into risks of stocks falling off one by one because they've been a unison for so long. Their correlations have been so strong to the upside. We're not there yet. And so there's room here. Heading into October, which is notoriously volatile, I like to call it a volatility amplifier and volatility can go two directions, but we don't get to be surprised if we continue to build another range through October, stair-stepping higher or some type of another corrective move, you know, because we, we get 5% corrections frequently in markets. We get 7% corrections frequently in markets and we even get 10% corrections that are frequent in markets. But we continue to see higher highs, higher lows, rising 200 day moving average. Let's not overcomplicate things. It is. And it's so easy to overcomplicate things. It's so easy to make brass decisions, right? Like, I mean, screw it. If Kamala's going to win and I think she's just going to be awful, like, I mean, I'll just get a cash now. You know, like people get really ahead of themselves. We saw it in 2016, saw it in 2020. We've seen it for hundreds of years, markets are, I'm sure people got ahead of themselves back in the sixties, maybe not, maybe no, maybe no one cared about elections. If there's anyone who trades stocks in the sixties, let us know what your walls of worry were like. Well, Ian, how many, how many elections were not the most important ever? I mean, this one for sure is it's like ever, ever, ever. Right. I mean, the while 2020 depends on it, right? While 2020 was the most important ever before that though, 2016 was the most important, but before that, 2012, but before that, the though, I mean, remember how important 2008 and 2012 were? Yeah. It's the most important ever. Right. I mean, the 96 election really the important. important ever. Yeah. Until the now. Future of your country depends on this. The future of the market. So we digress and sarcastically so, but it's because we humans do a tremendous job of making everything the most important ever. And while elections are important, we do a really good job of trying to make what's upcoming the most important. I'm not saying elections aren't important. They absolutely are. I mean, we live in a- Trust me, 2028, they're going to tell you that it's the most important election ever. Correct. So. While we have that bias in us, 
the beauty of using technical analysis and charts to study the visualization of supply and demand is we can see the ramifications of an election. You know, if we, if we're breaking below a 200 day moving average, if we are making lower highs and lower lows, well, yeah, let's take that information in as true Bayesians, take that information and, and, and value it as being, oh, maybe we're starting to see the supply have control over demand. Maybe we've run out of buyers. Maybe they're just selling pressure at this point in time. But to sit in cash at this point, what's your process then for getting back involved? And if you don't have one and it's just on a hunch or what you think, how many times do our thoughts lead us astray? And so you better have an objective process to identify when you're wrong. And technical analysis does that. I think it's really hit home and I kind of got a chuckle this week. So for the, and my, my story is going to, they will play into what you were talking about, Dave. We got, we got time for this. Let's do it. But so we have to do these quarterly memos for the ETF. Yep. Just a compliance thing. And we have to fill out slides. Most of it's data driven. And Kevin plops it in there. And really at this point, it's just updating things. But we were joking because one of these slides is a market and economic outlook. We don't provide any economic outlook. You know, and we tell them that. It's not part of our process internally, no, nor does it play a role in what the ETF does. So who cares? Uh, but the, the market, so this will be the second time we also copied and pasted this in May. So we, we're now February, tw there's a, a memo in late February, a memo in late May, and now here, late August. And, you know, we've just been... We've copied and pasted it because nothing changed. We remain bullish on U.S. equities, especially with the breakout to new all-time highs in January for the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, and Dow Jones Industrial Average. As technicians and trend followers, we believe higher highs beget more higher highs until they don't. Now, this is at that time. We have recently experienced one of the strongest four-month historical rallies in broad equities with indices bottoming in late October in each of the previous cases type of move did not occur prior to a major market top. That quite the opposite is true. This sentiment still remains in our opinions and not changed as long as the S&P 500 remains above 4,800 and a 200 day moving average, we will remain bullish on the equity market. So if you thought that those were just things that Dave got, Dave and I got on here and talked about, you know, but I wonder how frustrated that, I mean, we actually haven't written a, a new market outlook in nine months yeah. because I can literally just be like, here, here's what I told you in February. Now what else you want from us? Right. Ian, have you ever played Uno? Yeah. With my grandmother, my grandmother loved playing. So you're, you're sitting playing Uno with, with grandma and all your favorite family and friends and the card you draw or gets handed to you says, fight the trend or draw 25. What are you doing? Well, probably, probably drawing 25. Yeah, I'm drawing 25. My hand, my, I'll, I'll have to use both hands. This is how, you know, and I get it. It's, I get it because I used to do it. I used to pay attention to the headlines. I get it. I get why emotionally people do it. At some point, you know, Building, creating, maintaining wealth has got to be, it's got to be bigger than the TV. Right. Having a process has got to be bigger than the nightly news. Well, do you, I mean, we're not U.S. senators or House of Representatives, so we don't have inside info. Because do you think by watching a certain financial news network or clicking on a certain link gives you an edge? Because by the time it's to that point, it's no longer an edge. And how many times? I think times... it's the same in these people that watch ESPN all day. I think it's going to make them better at betting on DraftKings. Yeah. It, by the time that information is there, it's too late. B, it's what the crowd is reading. A C, do you know how many times those outlets are used for unloading a position? 
And so consumer beware. He's or you talk about, right? A lot of headlines out oh, about how invested in David Tepper is in China. Well, we'll see. Maybe he could also get out. I don't know. Well, I was just going to say he needs people. He needs volume in that market if he's going to participate in it. He needs to take down those profits and maybe help the Panthers a little bit. Alignment. Yeah, he, he probably needs some a little more protection for his QBs. I'm not sure. But the point remains that financial news outlets have an interest and it's not yours. Meaning their job is to get clicks and eyeballs in order to sell razor blades and cars and other things. Because if they don't have viewers, they don't have a product. Well, my big thing, 90% of them never done, like they just went straight from journalism school to, you know, being a gopher at MSNBC or CNBC or wherever, and then work their way up. And like, they've never done, it's the same with ESPN. Like, okay, Skip Bayless. Skip Bayless played middle school basketball. And like, now you're going to, like, you care about his opinion on like the NBA like, who's the best? Who's the worst? It's the same thing. So don't get... Like, who cares? These people have never made any type of investment decision outside of what target date fund they've got in their 401k. Correct. And they're going to sens- sensationalize headlines for the now rather than understanding that the market is a future discounting mechanism looking out 6 to 18 months in the future. It's a weighing machine. In the day-to-day price movements, It's those are the trees. The higher highs, higher lows, the rising 200-day moving average, that's the forest. So stop star- staring at the tree and look at the forest. These are spooky, though. Yeah, they can be. I remember when we were in Muir Woods out in California. I think it's Muir. I think that's what it's called. Pretty, pretty eerie. I mean, very quiet, but the trees are beautiful. But you got to take it as a collective. You got to take the information as a whole. And so what are we seeing, you know, across the board? We, you know, we... We're guilty of being S&P 500 focused, understandably so. One of the best indexes on the planet. It uses momentum. Yeah, find a, find a new index for me to focus on and right. we'll chat about it. And maybe maybe in Connor's day, your son's day, there will be a different index. Maybe it'll be in two years. I have no idea. And then we'll focus on that index. But for now, the S&P 500 being one of the most prolific indexes for the past, well, I'm going to say 14 years. That's it's everything's about relative strength. So where where are we seeing strength in this market? I would say a lot of things have it's better than we were a month or two ago. Obviously, tech. I mean, tech as a sector, XLK pretty weak. Yeah, I mean, we're sector today. It's been below a relative two hundred day since mid July. Now it hasn't fallen apart, but. It, and yet markets have gone higher over that time. I'm not saying it's been the easiest ride, but we've gone higher without tech leading. And so that would make sense that things under the surface, more things would be participating. Market goes higher, large cap tech, not really your leader. So, I mean, something has to be Pushing the market high. Gold mine. I mean, yeah, gold miners are better. Gold itself. Gold. I mean, gold miners look good. Right. Is that risk off? And when we look at you, you brought up tech. And if we look at the forest and say, let's look at tech stocks versus S&P stocks. And you notice that we run into resistance that has a 24 year memory going back to the 2000 top and tech has paused here. You're just simply saying that doesn't mean the the bull market equities is over. It's just the opportunity to outperform the S&P in using tech is tough at this spot. But you've had, I mean, then, I mean, you semi, semis have had a nice relative recovery. Right. We're back above a relative 200 day on builders, aerospace defense. Yeah. Aerospace and defense. Which has been pretty good. This yeah, I mean, and there's, a aer- there's an aerospace part of that that's interesting. 
like we say aerospace and defense, but when you look at the aerospace space, not too shabby. Are we investing in rockets and spaceships? Are we investing in financials and Chinese equities? If the world is about to fall apart? Probably, probably not. Probably not. And Brad hasn't, for me, advanced decline lines are fine. I mean, we're not ripping. We're not ripping. This is not November, 2023. However long that last, it was a long, like end of March. And that was cool. That was fun. Although, I mean, what we've had like three red days this month. Well, so I take that back since three red days in the last what is that, three weeks. Well, we've had one negative week in September and that was the first week in a notoriously weak month, seasonality speaking. And if we're bucking that tendency, that's risk on. If we're, we look across the risk on and risk off spectrum and we're buying emerging market tech and emerging market high yield, like emerging market high yield moving higher or junk bonds moving higher, or you're you're more out on the spectrum using something like ICVT, which is your credit market for more risk on behavior type tech stocks. Those are moving higher. You've got European financials and our financials across the board moving higher. I know you shared a great chart on Caterpillar industrials moving higher. How you just mentioned housing moving higher, Russell 1000 equally weighted breaking out to new highs. Now you, and now you're sitting on the precipice of transportation stocks, which have been sideways since 2021. So three years of sideways, 0% return in transportation stocks. And if those are going to confirm and move higher, triple C credit spreads cooling off. I don't know how many more boxes you need to check. That's quite a be, few. Yeah. I mean, I, what's there a complaint about, but people love to complain and and we can be back next week. We can be back below, you know, I, when you look at the S and P 500, you know, if we're back below 56, 60, okay. So we continue to build that auction process up. And when you look at the auction process from early November last year through now, all these, I'll call them mini corrections, all they've done is caused interactions between buyers and sellers that have moved the process up, have have moved the auction pricing up. And that's a quality, quality characteristic. I'd be a lot more concerned if the point of control in this market was much lower, but the point of control in something like the S and P 500 is currently sitting around 5,200. I don't, I really, I really don't know what else, what else to tell people. So does that make you feel like we're more like kind of locked in to stay about 4,800? Yeah. I mean, I do think there's some levels now that are higher than 4,800 that you can manage risk with I, as the way, I guess I would put it, you know, yeah, you got you can think you're going to the 52, 52, 50. Yeah. You've got a 200 day moving average at 52.28 on S and P cash. You have the low in April at 49.70. You have the test of the, of a low volume profile near 50. I, I, did you say it? 52.50. So you have some levels here where if you're, if, if selling takes it below those levels, you could say, okay, now the bullish thesis is under threat and you can always take your foot off the gas pedal at those points. But until that, this market is guilty of an uptrend until that point. I mean, a rising 200 day moving average, rising 50 day moving average. Do you mention, you, you mentioned 5,600, right? Right. I think below that short term would be a little. And I could see that. I could see that in October. I could see us coming back to the 50 day moving average, which is around 5460, 54, 5470. And seeing, making sure we know where the buyers are. Cause that's all the, that's all this process is, is confirming where the buyers are and where the sellers are. It's called price discovery. Price moves lower until it finds buyers, until it finds demand and then it moves higher until it finds sellers and it moves lower. That's in the end what price is doing because there's trillions of dollars at work across credit markets, stock markets. We haven't even touched on commodities. Well, you did a little bit. You talked about gold itself. Now you you're starting. What about commodities? Yeah, 
I think it's interesting. You know, we talked a little bit about oil last week and we can continue to test the 65 to 67 level. Be nice to see that hold from that perspective. When you look at energy stocks, they have broken down. They're in a downtrend. You have a falling 200 day relative moving average versus the S&P. We're below an important horizontal level. So right now, energy stocks are not the place to be. They are an opportunity cost. And that might become more abundant. That might be more abundantly clear if oil was below that $65 level. But base metals, we, we saw a strong move out of copper, copper miners, a, a, an extremely cyclical and industrial metal, industrial metals themselves, some strength. And here we are sitting with the dollar still fighting this 100 level using something like DXY, a trade weighted dollar. Now, if you see that 100 level on the dollar break, now you're talking about a, trying to go visit 90 or 89 on the trade weighted dollar. And, you, and then you start wondering, well, what does that mean for anything priced in dollars? And again, this goes back to what we talked about last week. Why are we involved in markets? If the dollar, your purchasing power is moving lower, you want to be involved in things that are protecting against that situation. And equities is a place. Some commodities could be a place that's TBD to be determined, but all these risk on areas tell us it's still a bull market. Even bonds, you know, I mentioned junk bonds. You have AGG, the aggregate bond complex, a retest of the 101 level. We'll see where that leads. But it is interesting. I think you highlighted this last week. You saw TLT rally prior to the rate cut announcement. And since the rate cut announcement, TLT has moved lower. It's almost as if treasuries are also a future discounting mechanism. Tell them us like, it was a well known. Yeah, they've got, I mean, they're back below that 100 level. I don't know, guys, too. Like, I'm just. I know what my, I know what my multi-decade outlook is on bonds. So it doesn't surprise me that it's having a hard time getting into any type of uptrend. And we've talked about there will be counter trend moves. There will be uptrends. But yeah, I think just a tough, tough spot. And then of course, you know, bonds versus stocks, just, you can't. I mean, that is a clean, clean, if you want to pull up TLT versus SPX and put it, slap a 200 day on there, that is a, that's been pretty clean for about three years. Yeah. And that's where you're paying the price in a 60, 40 portfolio an opportunity cost price. And it's important to look at ratios. I mean, you look at something risk on versus risk off, you look at staples versus S and P. You look at staples versus discretionary. So while on an absolute basis, XLP staples clearing prior highs from 2022, moving higher, but underperforming discretionary, I don't know. Are you, are you buying a Tesla rather than buying bleach? Well, that's information. Are you is, you know, cause I know from our internal work here, people still, still like to buy their shoes. People are still going out to eat. And now you're starting to see a change in price for airline stocks. And what was RTH was going, yeah, RTH. I think it's a pretty solid absolute chart. Yep. Out of I mean, that's retail. So I, there's really not much else that we can add from a weight of evidence standpoint to highlight how strong Lowe, this market is. I think is. Lowe's hit all time highs this week. Yeah. Home Depot. Home been very strong. So risk on evidence across the board. Does that eliminate volatility? Of course not. We're heading into one of the more volatile months there is in October. Will there be corrective moves during this? Absolutely. But it's the same, you know, back in March, we talked about buy the freaking dip, BTFD. That's the environment we're in. And yeah. I'll get a lot. I'll get a lot more nervous when BTFT becomes the mantra across the industry, which is not what we're seeing right now from a sentiment, sentiment perspective. I would say we are very, very far from 
any type of sentiment extreme. I mean, even if you look at something like, let me pull it up. I got it in front of me. Put call ratio. Okay. I mean, it's still, yeah, I just, we haven't had any extreme moves all year, really. Except for maybe the August stick spike. Maybe there was a spike there or in July, but the information can need, continues to stack up and I feel like it's appropriate to highlight the supporter of this podcast, the adaptive select ETF listed on the NYSE under ticker ADPV, which helps investors access two of the most prevalent factors in markets, momentum and relative strength. Using proprietary identification methods, the adaptive select ETF attempts to own the strongest 25 large cap stocks when the market is in an uptrend. And since not all market environments are the same, adaptive select seeks to prevent extended declines by moving to short-term treasury bills and cash during long-term market downtrends. Investors can find out more, including how to invest in ADPV by visiting adpvetf.com or calling 1-833-880-5200. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. ADPV is distributed by Quasar Distributors, LLC. Ian, we are up against the end of our time, but it's our show. We could do whatever we want. Any other place you'd like to highlight for our listeners before we sign off? I, don't, I, I mean, it's not a rip, it's not a rip roaring uptrend, a lot of back and forth. I mean, even intraday, but I don't think that takes away. Yeah, I think that's hard to expect at this stage off the bottom for sure. But you I mean, we continue to hold up. There's been multiple times where bears could have really do done something but just unable to really get any meaningful supply going in, in the market. And, you know, I think interme short intermediate term 5,600 is a good line in the sand. Sure. We didn't touch base much on crypto, but you look at Bitcoin yeah. above Bitcoin above 66,000. I think that's an important level. You know, we've been trying to chew through supply that sits at 70,000, we'll use a nice round number. And that's been going on since the beginning of the year, but we're above a 200 day moving average now. Now, granted, it's a sideways moving average. And so that means a hot mess. So not necessarily, a, by very definition, that's a sideways move, that's not a trend. But the fact that that's holding up could be information about what the dollar does here, but it, you know, we can't be surprised when I talk about October being about month of volatility and amplifying volatility, let's not forget that volatility can happen to the upside and markets do surprising things all the time. The most likely scenario from a seasonal perspective, the tendency would be for some type of sideways range or corrective move in stocks going into the election. But do we really get to be surprised? If the dollar's breaking below 100 on a trade weighted basis, and we're seeing stocks move much higher during October, I don't think we do. Nor, yeah, and then you've got this. Now you got China coming in, which is a risk. On I mean, you just mentioned Bitcoin. You know, I think you got to put that on the risk on market. So yeah, I just I don't see. Okay, let me let me ask you this. There's okay. what, like, okay, what, what cracks do you see? What, like, so not just anything right now that makes you say, and eh, this is not a, like as strong as an uptrend. Yeah. I let this, this, so I love this because this makes my heart go pitter patter because we should always be like a good defensive end, head on a swivel when we get through the offensive line, super easy. So think some potential red flags. You mentioned tech no longer being an opportunity versus S and P when you look at the big boys. So the S and P is at new highs, but you look at Microsoft, not at a new high. You look at Apple, not at a new high. You look at meta trying, trying to, and it actually did this week, create a new high. You look at Google, not I a new was, high. You know, you look at Amazon, not at a new high. So the very large 
pieces of the S&P 500. You could even use XLG, which is the largest 50 stocks of the S&P 500 or OEF, which is the largest 100 stocks of the S&P 500. Those are not a new highs. And so that's called divergent behavior. And if those type of stocks don't want to lead, that's one thesis that could say, okay, is this distribution? The other way to look at it, I will put a caveat in here, is that's sitting in the hip pocket. So all, all game long, Pat Mahomes has not played well. You're still winning. I like that scenario because all it takes is Pat Mahomes starting to play well. And now things are dominant. And so we'll see. I mean, th that would, for me, those would be some of the potential red flags. Maybe another one would be how cool the VIX is, meaning it's cooled off since it's spikes in July and August. Yeah. Does it, does it rear its head again going into October that we get an increase in volatility and some downside? Could be. How about you? What are, what would you say are, I would, mm -hmm. if I, if I can, I would add another one. And that would be if transportation stocks can't clear yeah. 70, 70 bucks, I think that's You're a little using bit. IYT? Yeah. I'm using IYT. But when you look at that formation going back to 2021, it's very constructive. But if it can't do it, 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 it's, it goes back to the adage, if something should do something and it doesn't, that's where you pay attention. So if IYT can't clear 70 when it looks like it, it should, that would be information. And if we're back below a 200-day moving average, if we're back below the, the, the flush that happened in August, which is at 6180, if we're back below that and that's a failure, probably hard times for the market. Probably. What about, what about you? So really, I want to see Russell get above 225 and I don't. We can have a party if, if when Russell, if Russell clears 244, 243, I feel like we should have a party for him. Like congratulations on moving out of the house. I don't know, last time we had a party, he back in 2021, he trashed it. Yeah, he did. Table was that whole thing. Really nice setup on the table, chips and dip and appetizers and chicken wings and a good quality beer. And he came in and flipped the table. No, I think that's a good point. Anything else? I think every, well, S and P and Dow are the only stocks back at all time highs. Both have RSI divergences. Okay. So, so momentum divergences, that's yeah. fair. I like the wars, you know, divergences can diverge in a long time. Dow actually, I think it's fascinating that Dallas like looks the best, but it's relative chart is so bad. Well, then what does that say about the S and P then? Yeah. Being on an absolute basis, the Dow looks fantastic on a relative basis. It's an opportunity cost. Which then we can say, oh, that means there's more strength here in the S&P 500 than we thought, regardless of how it looks. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Okay. Anything else you want to highlight for our listeners before we wrap it up? Okay. Not, if, and you're listening to this and you really appreciate the information. One of, one of the ways that you could pay us back is sharing it with others, giving us a high ranking on whatever your favorite podcast platform is of choice is we're across all of them we hope you guys enjoyed this episode and thanks ian for being on here again with me this week and i and i hope you guys stay dry thank you hey have a great weekend everyone 